Hello friends, it is I, with the long-awaited Girl Defined book review part two. Part one is a couple weeks old at this point, so I'm sorry I'm bad at things. So if you haven't seen part one, go check that out. And once you're done with that and ready for a second helping of suffering, come back here for the other half of the harrowing tale of the Girl Defined girls doing some things, judging some women, teaching us about biblical womanhood. Oh wait, I didn't put my son. Now this video is complete. This is his new sister, by the way. She's looking gorgeous already. She will be longified at some point in the future. Chapter eight. It is time for another case study in womanhood gone wrong. I just, I, I think I, I lose a couple minutes off my life. It's almost undetectable. It's just, just a really small amount, but I do think I lose a couple minutes off my life every time I have to say that. So I've never heard of this person they're talking about before, but apparently she won a competition by Victoria's Secret to like recruit models or something. So there's this model, she was a random woman, she won a competition, she became a Victoria's Secret model. Right, okay. So she was a model for a year and she ended up giving it up because she hated the lifestyle, she hated the pressure to be look perfect all the time. Kylie left her fame and status behind to pursue something much more fulfilling. I quit being a Victoria's Secret model to be a Proverbs 31 wife, she said. <laughs> this chapter is very much like the Marilyn Monroe chapter where they've already put so many words in this mo woman's mouth and put so many thoughts in her head that I assumed this was just another thing they were making up until I saw- no, there is in fact actually a citation on this one. This woman gave up being a model to become a Christian wife, so clearly this proves that you too should strive to be a Christian wife instead of a model. I, Christian, remember a time in my life when physical beauty was clearly an idol in my heart. I was convinced that if only I had- did you catch that? If only I had dot 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 longer thicker hair, I'd be truly happy- oh my fucking god, it's this part. I remember this. It's been like, I actually read this book in a very timely manner. It's just taken me forever to get around to filming this. So I'm like, I've forgotten a lot of this actually and I'm reliving it as I read through my notes and I'm fucking, this one's a doozy guys. <laughs> okay. If only I had longer, thicker hair, then I'd be truly happy. I was sure that if I had long locks, then I'd be the most confident, well-liked, secure woman around. I just needed the hair. So she gets hair extensions. Wait, wait, give me a second. So this is Jessica. My sister and I bought her on a whim one day from a costume store for like $30. Every time I put it on, everyone in my house screams because I look straight. So I've never actually worn it anywhere. Hi guys, it's Jessica. Thanks for tuning in to this week's vlog. I just got done baking bread for my husband, Jeremiah. Anyway, I just needed the hair. And here I am, going too far for this bit. I'm gonna get so hot in like approximately 30 seconds. Okay, so she gets some hair extensions, right? And then they get really tangled and her mom has to cut them out of her head and now she has even less hair than before. Oh my god, what a travesty, what a touching tale. About what? Am I just not straight enough to get it? Am I... Is there something wrong with me that I... I... Take better care of your hair extensions next time, Kristen? I don't know. Listen up, kids. This is okay. Jessica's coming off. This is serious, but oh my god. The beauty industry is evil and is pushing increasingly impossible standards to leech as much money out of us as possible. And that problem is made exponentially worse by the accessibility of photo editing software. So now, it's not just big beauty companies, which you can tell yourself, oh, that's just big beauty companies. No, now your neighbor Miranda is pushing the exact same impossible standards on Instagram, and you can never tell what's real and what's fake anymore. Modern beauty standards are a problem. However, I just don't- I agree with the Girl Define Girls on that. I just don't agree with them that the solution is becoming a biblical life. Anyway, thanks to our sinful hearts, we're constantly battling against our flesh. Flesh. Flesh is, flesh is- flesh is such a word that just feels the type of way. You know, it's like moist. We'll be the first to admit that we're not perfect. We are tempted by the beast just like you. Each of us has specific things about our physical appearance that we don't always love. For example, I, Kristen, have been really ungrateful for my nose at times. I compare its shape to other people's noses and wish it were a little thinner. If your nose looks like this and you complain about it, I will know and I will come to your house and make you eat printouts of my pre-nose job photos. <gasps> Chapter 9 opens with Bethany talking about how Aladdin brainwashed her as a child, like the Disney movie. I'm realizing now, like, or I was realizing as I read this, like, I've always kind of assumed Kristen to be the brains of the operation just because she 
like if you watch the girl defined videos and even reading this she has the vibe of a 30 something year old woman who at least somewhat has her shit together bethany has the vibe of a confused 15 year old i think i heard her describe herself in a video once as a 29 year old girl and that's just that's that's it so anyway as a child she was brainwashed by the culture uh specifically the disney movie aladdin to, to expect her future husband to be just the most per all around perfect handsome prince most romantic relationships and marriages are built on the belief that true love should always create happy feelings once the happy feelings are gone love must be gone too right so what happens the couple breaks up or gets divorced I'm so I am so scared about where this is going. They then get into some more Bible translations. Apparently, a Greek word that's used for love in the Bible translates more directly to self-sacrifice. So love is not something that should make you happy. It's not even really about emotions at all, according to them. It it's self-sacrifice. This part of the book very much feels geared towards like young teen girls who don't really know how relationships work yet because I don't know anyone who thinks about relationships the way they're assuming non-Christians do, who aren't teenagers. Like, we all know relationships are complicated. We don't expect our partners to be perfect. We're not out here breaking up over the most minor inconveniences like they seem to assume. You don't need Jesus to have basic morals and common sense. If you want some Jesus too, that's cool. You can have some Jesus, but we don't all need some Jesus. If my husband isn't a fairy tale prince, then he's not good enough and we need to get divorced. Nobody thinks that relationships are that simple and one-dimensional, they just don't, unless they're like 14. In which case, you break up over the most minor inconvenience, and that's probably fine because you weren't gonna meet your soulmate at 14. <laughs> Although the Bible doesn't give us a cookie-cutter guide for how every romantic relationship should play out, it does give us principles for how our gender roles should guide, the, re should guide the relationship. Since the man is created to be the leader, this clues us in on who should be the initiator and pursuer in the relationship. This clues us in on who should be the responder. Scoot over and let him lead. A headstrong Christian woman named Heidi learned this the hard way. She saw a guy she liked, she asked him out, she insisted on paying for half of their dates, she called him, she kissed him, she brought him, she brought up the subject of marriage, she negotiated the terms, she insisted on a hyphenated name, she made him give up his job and move because of hers. Now fast forward 10 years into their relationship. Heidi hates her husband, her complaint, he's unmotivated, a dead weight, he doesn't initiate, he's wimpy, whiny, he's disgusting. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> she's the only one contributing and she's exhausted. Wait a minute, Heidi. Let me get this straight. You asked him out, you pursued him, you took the lead, you dominated the relationship like putty in your hand. You molded him into what you wanted him to be and now you hate him for it? What's more, you expect him to go against years of emasculation and suddenly become a man? Why should he? You're the man in your house, or at least you pretend you could be. Oh! Holy shit, Kristen just snatched her soul through her kneecaps. You've got one partner who's too dominant and one who's wimpy and useless and disgusting. And the solution is not, in fact, equality, but the solution is just flipping those gender roles. Here, here are ways to do that in a good Christian relationship. Encourage his leadership. Basically, the man always has to make the first move and make all of the decisions in the relationship. Speak words of life. That's a very wholesome way of saying, be nice to your stupid little man baby. He needs compliments for his big man ego. Help him succeed. Be encouraging, I guess. <laughs> Let him be strong. He needs to open doors for you or his ego will crumble. Please, for the love of God, be gentle with the men. They're so dumb. I'm, I'm starting to think this brand of Christianity isn't actually misogynistic. It just assumes everyone is dumb as a brick and needs constant hurting. Honestly, things make a lot more sense after reading this chapter. Use your femininity to promote purity. Essentially, do not have sex or you will die. Bethany's personal heart-to-heart -heart advice for other single Christian girls is that if you get horny, read the Bible instead. <laughs> the subtext is not- it's barely even subtext, man. <laughs> Once your heart is right, look for ways to help your brothers in Christ achieve purity. Exercise self-control in how much you touch him. Dress in a way that draws attention to your face rather than your curves. Use discretion regarding the movies and TV shows you watch together. Anyway, that's a lot. So Kristen's advice as the married sister, she gets to give the advice to the married women. And that advice is to uh, never read romance novels or be in the same room alone with another man who is not your husband so as to avoid all possible temptations or at all questioning that your relationship is anything but good. Yeah, I mean, I guess that naturally follows. I mean, you're not supposed to be happy in your relationships. Because if you're not happy, you're gonna 
look somewhere up. yeah I that fits I'm not y'all <laughs> y'all need to eat a whole raw potato chapter 9 study guide in what ways has Hollywood's version of love influenced your thinking I am so starved for good gay representation that's it I literally shed tears every time I see a lesbian on screen that fucking lizard from Doctor Who I would die for her and her wife chapter 10 Kristen has decided to bless us with another anecdote which sucks less in fact it doesn't suck! It actually, actually, it's kind of good! She talks about this time that she went to a business dinner with her husband's company and she felt really terrible all night in comparison to all of these rich and successful intellectual people, including the women there. And she felt embarrassed talking about what she does for a living because it's not really something that society values or rewards with millions and millions of dollars. And that's valid as hell! That's a real human emotion you just expressed! You can probably relate to my feelings on some level. We live in a society! That equates a person's success with how much money they have, whether their business is prosperous or how prestigious their career is. And that's a no-no because careers are for men. But once again, there is an interesting point buried in there under all of the Jesus. Something that affects all of us, not just women, is the basing of our self-worth on work. I've had so many days in quarantine where I'm like, I feel shitty because I didn't do anything today. Meanwhile, I read a book, I talked to my friends on Discord, I went on a bike ride to the bakery and got some sexy ass sourdough. Those are things that I enjoy and that are valuable, but they don't feel valuable because they're not work. Work is just not the only way we should be measuring our quality as humans. And I think so many anxious people around my age need to work on that. Back to Girl Defined. <laughs> Back to my personal hell and other news. Hard work is good because sometimes women in the Bible worked in fields, but make sure you work hard at the good God approved goals. There's only two. Number one is to glorify God, and number two is to bless and serve their families. A long-standing joke between men and women is that men don't like to ask for directions and women do. Although this is a humorous difference, it reveals an insightful contrast between the genders. <laughs> I'm sorry, I haven't read this in a hot second. Women love directions. I'm gonna cry, what the fuck? They then bless our souls with a handy dandy list of Bible passages that, what are these? Basically a rule book for being the right kind of woman. Free yourself from oppressive lists, am I right women? That was like a whole thing in the first half of the book that society has this list of things, this checklist that they want every woman to check off, and that's wrong. List, you should free yourself from this e these evil lists, and now they're just give, they're just like, here's a list of passages on how to live your life. I, Kristen, don't have kids yet and Me Bethany isn't married, so it should be obvious that we believe God can use a woman in many ways. However, the two of us are passionate about valuing marriage and motherhood for one simple reason, because God does. As Christian women, we are called to be like him. If God values something, then we should too. It's time to answer some tough questions that we are all struggling with as good Christian women. Womans? What was I about to say there? Anyway, tough questions like, is it bad for women to strive to do well in school? Just these questions that we all ask ourselves, that we normal people on a daily basis all the time. Anyway, it's all okay because they've developed a handy dandy filtering system. Because that's not a really ominous phrase. Uh, to decide whether God approves of your dis life decisions or not. Step one, don't work in a strip club or anything because like that's gross, Jesus doesn't like it. Step two, is your motivation for doing absolutely everything you do must be the Lord and nothing else. If your motivation for becoming a doctor is to serve others, share the love of Christ and bring joy to your patients, then this is a good biblical motivation. What if I want to become a stripper to share the love of Christ? How, how do you know otherwise? Step three, your occupation as a woman must never interfere with the baby making. Helpful anecdote here is about a woman called Lindsay. She was young and wild once, she went to college, she got a degree. Lindsay, you are unhinged. She made a tragic mistake, she didn't consider the consequences of going to college and getting a degree. Now that she's a good biblical wife and mother like we all eventually end up, she's filled with regret and student debts. Plan smart for your future. You want to get an education? You, you really think that's a good idea, huh? You want to use your brain, huh? Jessica, you have ambitions, Jessica? Do you really think that's a smart decision for your future as a biblical woman? Chapter 10, study guide. Open your Bible and read Proverbs 31, 10, 31. Pick one quality you can put into practice today. God, this is giving me flashbacks to high school. Where's the table of contents? Where's Proverbs? Page 725. <laughs> I literally have not done this since high school. I fucking hated finding Bible passages. Proverbs 31. Ode to a capable wife. Okay. 
Go off, Proverbs. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises while it is still night and provides food for her household. I think my girlfriend is the one being the good biblical wife right now. She's out there making eggplant dip and I'm in here being a goblin on the internet. She considers a field and buys it. <laughs> Catch me considering a field and buying it. <laughs> That's the one. That's the one I'm implementing in my life today to be a good biblical woman. I'm gonna go fucking run away and be a farmer. Proverbs, huh? Cool. Chapter 11 starts with a story about them going to a conference on biblical womanhood and their minds are just... Apparent. Okay, first of all, glazing over the fact that conferences on biblical womanhood apparently exist. But, so they go and their minds are just blown by all of these galaxy brain takes and they are so inspired to start applying all of these great biblical principles of biblical womanhood to their lives. Trust us. We get it. Applying the truths of biblical womanhood is not easy. It's countercultural. Oh my god, you're like so cool. Unpopular. Challenging. Uncomfortable. And that is why most Christian women never transfer the head knowledge to the heart. Someone stop these rebels. They are a danger to society. Yeah, society's probably not gonna praise you for being a stay-at-home wife and mother. I agree with that take. But no one's gonna stop you either. <laughs> Don't try and make it out like you're being actively oppressed for being good Christian women. It's not... If I had lived in any other time period, it would be a real terrible time being gay. And I am thankful for that every single day. And I have so much respect for the queer people of the past who fought for that. So when I look at people like the Girl Defined Girls being like, we're challenging the culture, we're rebellious, we're countercultural, I'm like... My bitch. <laughs> a wimpy woman gives up on biblical femininity when life gets hard. A wimpy woman quits when she has to stand alone. A wimpy woman caves in when the culture pressures her. Like, oh my god, Becky, don't you know all of the cool kids are into biblical womanhood now? You're just not like brave enough to serve the Lord and like you can't sit with us. In fact, we're going to take you through an easy to understand acrostic of the word brave. <laughs> Please don't. The B in brave stands for bold. This basically means don't be ashamed to admit your beliefs. Don't be ashamed of aspiring to be a wife and mother just because our culture doesn't value those things as much anymore. You better fucking commit to biblical womanhood. Don't let, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't listen to people who try, don't, just don't listen to them. Just lock yourself real tight in that echo chamber. At first it's like they're trying to sound good and inspiring and be like, you need to be brave to do this. And if you do this, you're actually cool and rebellious. But then it turns into, if you don't do this, it's because you're wimpy and you're not brave enough. And then that turns into, if you ever question this, and therefore, because if you, if you go back on it, you're bad. So therefore you can never question it. It, it just, there's the layers like an onion. The R in brave stands for radical. No, like actually the section is really terrifying. They're like, yeah, we're religious extremists. So like, <laughs> what of it? We're actually really cool. We're not like other girls. Our ankles are only for Jesus. This is like kind of a masterpiece. Like I feel like I'm in high school and this clique of blonde girls has just given me one chance to join their like super cool clique of biblical women if I can prove that I'm cool enough. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm trying to eat my tuna sandwich alone. The A in brave stands for anchored. Read the Bible, memorize the Bible, never let anyone convince you to question the Bible. The V in brave, in case you forgot that we're doing an acrostic, stands for, it stands for vigilant. <laughs> Watchful and ready. The moment we let our guard down is the moment the enemy, Satan, will strike. The battle is real. You must be on guard. You must be vigilant against the enemy's attacks. In our experience, Satan's attacks have been sneaky and subtle. They've come through the media. What happened? Did Satan just fucking crawl out of your TV like the ring? The E in Brave stands for empowered. When I, Bethany, was in seventh grade, I did something that shocked an entire gymnasium full of people. I'm laughing because that sentence alone is hysterical, and I'm also laughing because I know where this is- Oh god, I blocked so much of this out in like the couple weeks it's taken me to make to film this video. Do you want to know? Do you want- do you do you want to know? Do you want to know what it is? Do you want to know what the quintessential example of empowerment in Bethany's life is? Are- are you sure? Are you 100% sure you want to know? Because I wish I didn't know! Seventh grade, it's like 12. She's a child of like 12. She's playing with a basketball as you do when you are a child of 12, and this younger boy comes up to her and starts screaming and throwing a temper tantrum because he wants to play with the ball. 
even though she's already playing with the ball because I don't know children are terrible little dicks so in my head I'm reading this and I'm like okay she's gonna give him the ball even though he's being a terrible little shit because I don't know Christian generosity and forgiveness or something she's gonna rise above the haters and be the bigger person and give him the ball even though he's a little shit instead of giving into this guy's tantrum I love how she says this guy as if it's just like this guy when it's like a tiny child <laughs> So, <laughs> instead of giving into this guy's tantrum, I threw the ball down the court in the opposite direction of him, smiled, and then walked away. The onlookers erupted into applause. I... everyone clapped! Everyone clapped. First of all, I don't believe you that everyone clapped. And second of all, you unironically used everyone clapped. In a funny sort of way, this is exactly how we, as Christian women, need to be. We need to know the truth and have confidence in our womanhood. When the world stomps its feet and rages against our decision to live out biblical womanhood, we can feel empowered and stand strong. I don't know if I'm following the metaphor here. You suggest we act like passive-aggressive seventh graders? You did give in to his tantrum by acting spiteful back, that's the thing. This is... This is the most empowered, radical thing she's ever done in her life. Here's the hot take. Biblical womanhood might be hard for someone who grew up in a progressive environment to undertake. They're out here ranting about how Christians are oppressed and traditional gender roles are counterculture. But you know, they've, they've received nothing but validation for doing this in their own lives, in their own small community of crazy people. They have very clearly admitted in this book multiple times that they only surround themselves with like-minded people. They have so little idea of what it means to be radical and empowered that they think it's exemplified by being a dick to a child throwing a tantrum one time. Grab a pen and paper or use your phone to record some numbers. You're going to rate yourself in regard to each letter from the word brave, because it's an acrostic, you remember our handy little acrostic of the word brave? On a scale from 1 to 10, with 1 being the lowest and 10 being the highest, at the end you will add up the score. Ready? Let's see how you measure up. They've just entirely gotten past the part of the book where they try and justify their ideas and now they've moved on to showing their true colors by just assuming they are right and shaming everyone who doesn't agree with them. Like literally, we're going to rate you and see how good you are? That's pretty fucking blatant. 12 begins with a story about how they both of them together decided to go out and buy some really tall heels for the first time because they never really worn them because they're six one without heels so they go out and buy some like actual tall heels for the first time so they're like six five now in these heels is what i'm picturing and they do this for the sole purpose of wearing these heels around the mall just go into the mall and getting an ego boost from people staring at them because they're like six five is this a normal thing to want to do are they terrible people or is this normal straight women please tell me it took me so long to buy platform boots like i love the way they look i love them so much if i was a short person i would wear them every day i'd have like 10 million pairs it took me so long to buy them because i hate being st i like i hate being that tall i hate being looked at that much i love crazy statement fashion i don't like people looking at me in public it's really i just really shot myself in the foot with that one <laughs> we're going to be totally honest with you the two of us battle against our prideful selfish hearts every single day we always struggle with wanting to turn heads in our direction yeah i, I gathered that from reading this book but Good on you for admitting it so plainly that you are in fact terrible ego egomaniacs. We fight hard to keep Jesus at the center of our thoughts. It's really just like so hard for us to be so hot. Like, I hope you understand that wanting physical beauty is wrong, but like, I hope you understand that we're just like naturally really hot, you know? It's just really hard for us, I hope you understand. It hurts my brain a lot. So jumping on to a completely different anecdote that has nothing to do with what they were saying before, as happens a lot in this book. Their parents run a house cleaning business, which they work for sometimes, but don't get it twisted, they don't do any of the cleaning. Except for one time that they accidentally overbooked the schedule so there was no employees free to go clean a house. So they had to go do it. They had to go clean a house. Oh my god, it was crazy. And the moral of the story is that they felt pressured to do a good job because they were representing their family's business, and that is how you should feel all the time, because you are representing the Lord. Once during a road trip, the two of us went into a caribou coffee... Co caribou coffee coffee house and both noticed the company's tagline life is short stay awake for it of course the tagline is referring to coffee and caffeine <laughs> but it unintentionally points to a deeper truth that's right 
Have you been sleeping on the Lord? That is right, ladies, listen up. If you care about your grades, that is a slippery slope to sex before marriage. And if you have sex, you will die and then you will go to hell with Satan. Maybe if you just stay subservient to a man, you won't have to worry about all of these scary things that could potentially happen. Wouldn't that be so much fun? Last time I wore my cross earrings to show what a good Christian woman is, this time I'm wearing my baby earrings to show that I value motherhood like God does. I mean, you already knew that. I, I realize I have to go put my son in the background again. Chapter 13 begins with Bethany visiting this old woman on behalf of her family's senior care company. How many companies does your family have and what's going on? <laughs> anyway, so this old woman that Bethany's visiting on behalf of her family's senior care company, which is a thing that is dropped with no explanation. Moving on. The old woman has a... The, hmm. I don't have coronavirus, I promise. I would be in the hospital because my lungs are shit. Actually, I don't know if I'm looking like a Christian woman. I might button this up. Are my buttons uneven? My fucking god, my buttons are uneven. So the point is that this old woman has a bunch of dancing trophies on her wall and then can very conveniently and not at all subtly launches into this backstory about how she ruined her relationship with her children because she was so caught up in her life ambition to be a dancer. I'm just wondering how much paraphrasing there was here on Bethany's part because that was really quite painfully convenient. Intrigue. One day she hears her dad on the phone trying to see if any of their employees are available to work on Christmas because this old woman has no one to spend Christmas with. Our prayer is that all women will invest their lives in something bigger than collecting trophies. The two of us want you to imagine the possibilities for what your legacy could hold. Having hobbies? Being good at things? Oh, that sounds like a slippery slope to dying alone to me. Also, how is making your contribution to art and culture not a good legacy? Or STEM, if that's your thing, ew. Obviously, we are sane people in the sane people world, and we know that there is no correlation between this woman being a champion dancer and having a bad relationship with her children, but we are in crazy land here. We need to be shown three good examples of working women. The first good Christian woman that we meet is Mrs. Harris. She and her husband, before they had kids turned their home into a shelter for homeless girls which is obviously an amazing thing to do and they take in this girl named Chloe who we know is a bad girl because she has pink hair and wears leather pants so Chloe falls in love with Mrs. Harris's nephew and they have five kids Mrs. Harris is obviously an amazing and generous person I don't know why Chloe was necessary to this story, I guess because it all has to relate back to Christian baby making. Yes, we should all be striving to help others and make the world a better place, and we should all be in awe of someone generous enough to turn their home into a homeless shelter. It, it Honestly, it concerns me when people present morals and religion as indistinguishable. Okay, Becky, you would spend your days as a horrible, vapid person dressing sexy to go to the mall and get stared at if you didn't have Jesus? That sounds like a you problem. Our next good example. I don't know why I'm still wearing this. This wig is disgusting. Can the worm stay, though? No, the worm doesn't want to stay with me. She's an independent woman. The next good example is of a woman named Anna who grew up in a supposedly Christian household, which means not good enough for girl to find, which in this case is actually valid because her dad was a terrible and abusive person. So now as an adult having experienced this trauma, she has trouble trusting men. She's not interested in having a good Christian family because her idea of one is not a positive one. She prayed to God and asked him to help her to value what he values. She, Christian baby making. She asked him to soften her heart towards the truth. She confessed her lack of belief in his design of manhood and womanhood and asked him to give her a desire for God to find femininity. And then she gets married and has numerous children. Imagine where Anna would be if she had chosen to reject God's design and hold on to bitterness. She certainly wouldn't be where she is today. That's right, if she didn't get married and have children, she sure wouldn't be married and have children. <laughs> what? I hate this. They use such manipulative language to make this sound all great and inspirational as if the solution to trauma is just having some children. I can barely tell anything about the lives of these women in these stories because the, the fog of like the intended narrative they have is so thick. I have no idea how these women actually feel or what it's like to live through these things. None whatsoever because it's just like constantly drilling it into you that like this is what you must take away from the story. Sadly, the two of us know many Christian women who are in less than ideal situations whether it's physical or verbal abuse and an absent parent or husband or divorce. We can't deny that Christian women are facing hardships if you are in or in fact come from a painful situation. We want you to know we are burdened for you. <laughs> Your life sucks. We feel so bad for you. We are so sorry that you have to endure pain because of the sinful choices of others. You spent this entire book, you spent 
this entire book telling women that they have to listen to their husbands. But if your husband is shitty and abusive, I'm sorry you've endured pain because of other people's sins. Which includes divorce, by the way. What the fuck are we supposed to do with- I I'm so tired. I'm so tired. Our third example is of a woman named Sarah who dates a lot of guys but is constantly getting broken up with and she decides no more. So she turns to the Lord and stays single instead and then one day she gets a call from a publisher who is intrigued by her life as a single woman. Am I missing something? Is she published elsewhere? Does she at least have a blog? Like where is my random ass call from a publisher like hey girl I'm intrigued by your life as a gay trash bag. Would you like a book deal? Yes, I would! So this woman wrote a book about being a single Christian woman and she, now she's 30 and still nobody wants to date her. However, it's fine and it's great because she's influencing the Christian youth and that's a good cause. So would the woman from the beginning of this chapter have lived a worthwhile life if she competed in good Christian dance competitions and influenced the youth? Like, fucking hell, what? This is so much to handle! <laughs> chapter 14, so in early high school, the girl defined girls find out that their mom is pregnant again. So they get another sister, and this is a segue into something about the beautiful bond between sisters. Can we get an amen from all the sisters out there? We're talking directly to you, girl. Yep, okay, I'm gonna try not to vomit here. Yep, sisters in Christ, all the way. <laughs> We may not be related by birth, but we are related through the blood of Christ. They then flex on us about how successful they are for a few pages, but it's okay because it's just God using them. You want a publishing deal too, bitch? Well, you better talk to Jesus about that one. Every good fairy tale starts with four little words, once upon a time, when we, as females, hear those words, we get excited. We love a good fairy tale. Just as fairy tales always start with four key words, your life story should end with six keywords. Well done, good and faithful servant. Matthew 25, 23. Your entire life should be lived with the purpose of hearing those final six words. Chapter 14 is the last chapter, so this book ends by like dialing the cultiness up to 1000 with no warning. And then the about the author two pages later is like, <laughs> we're just some fun loving Texas girls who love dark chocolate and fluffy dogs. If you've benefited from the wisdom of this book, don't keep it to yourself. Can you think of one friend who would benefit from the message of biblical womanhood? Buy her this book. Give us more money. Acknowledgements include God and Five out of six of their siblings, so that's probably some tea, I guess. I hated that. It was a horrible experience. Don't worry, I didn't spend any of your Patreon money on it. I signed up for a free trial on an ebook website and then read it within a month and then canceled my free trial after, yeah. Speaking of Patreon, you can go support me over there. I do live Q and A's every Wednesday on Discord, or you can just go enjoy some spicy content on my Instagram and Tumblr. Look at me actually promoting things like a real YouTuber for like the first time in six months. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. I had a horrible time. I hope you had a horrible time with me and I'll see you again next week for another horrible time.